everybody. Welcome to the History of FMW. This is going to be episode number 12. Today we're going to cover the second half of 1994. Uh, just for some context, where we had just left off, uh, Onita had just lost to Ten Ryu in a uh, May 5th Kawasaki Stadium show, and he had announced that he would be going on a one-year retirement show. So that's the context for this year going forward. Uh, starting in June, though, we're actually going to go, go across the ocean, uh, and Hayabusa is now working for EM. LL. Uh, he made his Arena Mexico debut in in late May, and uh, through throughout this year, he actually wrestles a lot. Um, what was Hayabusa's star like in in Mexico? In Mexi excuse me, in Mexico at this time. So, um, when we last left off with Hayabusa, he was in AAA. He wasn't getting many bookings and everything. Um, you know, he had been promised a lot of money, and he wasn't getting. You know, he'd only worked two shows in two months and everything. So he's he's getting he's getting in contact with Ultimo Dragon because he's in Mexico City, staying in the hotel with the, or the mo yeah the hotel with a lot of the Japanese wrestlers, and he's getting in contact with Ultimo Dragon, going, going please get me a job in the EM in the EMLL. Please get me a job. I you know I want to work. I I need to work, and I've only worked a couple times, pretty much in six, you know, plus months here in Mexico. So he ends, up, you know, Ultimo Dragon goes, "Hey, come on over to Arena Mexico with me, um, and I'll see about, you know, just hang out with me." So he ends up um, talking with some of the promoters and everything, um, and he goes, "Hey, hi, Lisa, I got you. I got." Got you a gig for today. You can work a, a match today. Well, Hayabusa wasn't even prepared at all. He had he brought a mask that he does not his in ring mask, but pretty much just like a regular mask that you wear to you know so people don't see your face, you know. And he didn't bring any pants or you know any wrestling tights or anything like that. His boots or whatnot. So he ends up in his first DMLL match. He wears and this is a pretty infamous picture actually. He's wearing his Zubas that he wore to the arena. Um, he was lucky to find some wrestling boots around and he's wearing a mask that's protecting his whole face pretty much like covering the eyes and, and everything so after you know he has that match and it ends up being a success and you know he ends up getting booked more and more they they really like his look they really like his athleticism um, you know so he ends up getting more and more and to where he's working you know two or three times a day even with the promotion so um and he ends up um becoming kind of taking over for uh, Brazo de Oro's uh, spot in the promotion is the young flying sensation. So he kind of uh, fits in real well, uh, kind of taking over somebody that had just left the promotion. All right, cool. Um, now, uh, also on July 22nd, uh, there was a show, uh, CMLL ran a show, and H Hayabusa main evented the show. And there was also, uh, the, he the, the, the headhunters were also on the show. Um like, was there any political friction from using FMW talent and also talent from IWA? No, no one really, you know, no one really cared. Then, you know, FMW, IWA weren't going to fight over, you know, their guys in Mexico getting, you know, bookings or whatnot. And, you know, Hayabusa pretty much had to independently get his own, you know, through Ultimo Dragon. It wasn't through FMW. Um, you know, and Ultimo Dragon was in the promotion. He was, you know, working for War and uh, War at the time. So it was, you know, th they didn't really care enough to bother with international bookings or anything like that. All right, cool. Um, now, uh, at the end of the... The month there was this angle, and I've always I've never known the story behind it. But apparently, uh, the great the excuse me, the great the great Sasuke uh, hot off the Super J Cup. He announced that he would be challenging Onita to an explosion match, and that he would also be retiring after. Now, obviously, he's still wrestling now. So what? So what was the point of announcing that he was going to quit? Just put interest in in the match and everything, kind of be like, hey, this might be a once-in-a-lifetime match. You'll get to see me versus Onita. I'm not going to be around much longer. I'm, you know, it's just a wrestling technique. I mean, and, and as we've covered a lot here, um, you know, just retirements, I mean, a lot of the times they just don't mean very much. And so, you know, and I mean, at this time, maybe Sasuke was really hurting or whatnot and thinking about it as well. Because, you know, you always hear wrestlers talking about retirement, and then they go – five, ten more years and everything, um, you know, and with Sasuke's case, he just might have been, you know, injured or whatnot, but, I mean, you know, they work um, retirement talk all the time, and like I said, it was probably just to put more interest in the match itself with Onita. Okay. Um, now, um, anyway, uh, on July 17th, uh, Onita participated in the war, the war show at Sumo Hall. Uh, it was a six-man tournament. Uh, he teamed with 
Tenryu and also uh, Bam Bam. Um, but this would be the last time that FMW and War would work together. And you wrote that Tenryu wound up uh, kind of upset with Onita. What, what was the issue between the, the two of them? He didn't get paid um, the amount he was promised by Onita for the Kawasaki match in May. So, um, you know, Tenryu kind of felt like he got stiffed on the pay when he was was one of the main reasons, obviously, that it drew um, over $2 million, um, you know, over $2 million in ticket sales and everything. So um, I don't know how much he got paid and how much he was promised, but he was upset over that, and that kind of ended the relationship um, between them for a couple years. Um, also on July 17th, uh, Onita ran a show, or I'm sorry, FMW, they ran their own show at, at, at Crokin Hall that evening, in the main event, Aoyagi ran in, and he attacked Onita to set up the next feud. Uh, what was Onita and Aoyagi's relationship since their first series? They hadn't really um, interacted very much over the couple years after Aoyagi uh, left uh, for Pioneer since back in 1990 for a higher payday. Um, you know, Aoyagi at this point, he had went on to work uh, New Japan for several years, and he was actually on the war card uh, at Sumo Hall that day. Um, so you, you mentioned 17th, and then FMW ran a show on July 17th. So that day, um, in the six-man uh, for war, Aoyagi and Onita kind of, you know they start squaring off again and the the heated you know the heated rivalry kind of picks back up you know after four years or so and so afterwards um you know ayagi is you know pissed off at onita again and that rivalry is kind of brought back and then so ayagi attacks onita um at the court after the Corrigan Hall show in FMW later that day, and then that's to set up, um, you know, that's to set up a future match between the two, um, because now you have like a four-year-old rivalry. You know, there's a backstory and there's a history, and this is what started FMW, and FMW feels like they can make money, and Onita and Oyagi, um, obviously, you know, they're business partners, and you know, they were working together as of until October before Onita retired um, this past uh, in 2017, even. Uh, cool. Now, um, moving over to IWA, uh, in in July, uh, they crowned Dick Slater their their first champion on the twentieth, and they also brought in a, a a new Jason the the terrible, and they had the two Jasons feuding. Uh, who were the two Jasons? That was Tracy Smothers again, and um, I believe uh, Roberto Rodriguez, I believe, is the other guy, the original Jason, uh, original Jason the Terrible. And Tracy Smothers was the second um, Jason the Terrible, just like had Wing had done, uh, bringing in two Jason the Terribles with Tracy Smothers. So they were just pretty much redoing the Wing, um, the Wing idea that they had done pre a couple years earlier. I'm just curious. Do you know, like, um, is there a uh, a system where one wrestler can can claim to be the real Jason? And, you know, if I go out on some indie show and I, I, I promote myself at, as Jason, am I going to get a call from, like, Tracy? Uh, as far as, like, copyright or anything? No. I mean, that's uh, – they don't – you know, I mean, it would be from the promotion itself even, I feel like. I mean, but especially not, you know, um, like a Jason, which is a ripoff of, you know, a uh, you know a horror movie character or anything like that. So they're not going to get a call or anything. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the, um, in IWA, the, the main angle is, is going to be, uh, uh, Kanemura representing Wing is feuding with IWA wrestlers and former Wing wrestlers. Uh, they're doing main event baseball bat matches and stuff. Um, how are IWA drawing on their first tours? It's healthy. I mean... You know, we had last talked about Wing was just kind of dying and everything. And this is, you know, a kind of a rebranding of, of Wing just with different management and everything. And so uh, with Wing going, you know, in the negative up until the very end, you know, it's a kind of a bright spot to see. Like, hey, here's an upstart promotion, you know, with the same guys and they're not losing money. It's it's. It's making, you know, it's it's making decent money, and you know, we're we're in 1994, where this is kind of the epic of Japanese wrestling and all the companies making money, and so you know they're selling out Cork and Hall and everything, and they're doing well, you know, on house shows and everything, and you know it, they're they're growing pretty much. It's a slow grow, which is an improvement over what Wing was doing there at the end. All right. Um, going back over to FMW at the end of the month on July 31st. Um, uh, there was a couple angles, Matsu Tsunaga and, and uh, Goto, they, they were feuding all through the month, and um, uh, just they were setting up a lot of angles. Can you go over, over 
this show. Well, okay, so on- Onita was always kind of, uh, you know, there was, well, there was always spectac- uh, skepti- skepticism uh, with Goto about Matsunaga and everything. And, you know, uh, um, whether he was going to really join Pogo because Pogo and Matsunaga had a relationship in Wing and everything. So after the show, um, Onita, or actually during the match, Onita is covered in barbed wire and everything, and Pogo is about to shoot a fireball at him, and Matsunaga ends up covering his body and taking the fireball instead during the match. So it's kind of to prove, look, I'm, you know, I'm with you. I'm not with Pogo, and everything. And so uh, Onita ends up getting the win for the. Um, him and Matsunaga end up defeating. Uh, Mr. Pogo and Hitsugatsu Oya um, in the main event. And then um, Oyagi, you know, as we talked about, he comes to the ring after the match and he ends up setting his shin guard on fire and he ends up kicking Onita with the the shin guard um, on fire um, several times and everything to set up, um, the, you know, to kind of just continue their feud and set up the match uh, the following month between the two. Um, also, at the end of the month, I saw I saw this news story. Uh, apparently, on July twenty first, uh, Tiger Jeet Singh was arrested in Canada, um, and uh, that's kind of where the story ends. Uh, do you know any more details about this? Yeah. So um, pretty much, it was fraud uh, fraud charges. Um, uh, essentially, his brother in law and a friend um, they had and they um, had a conspiracy to commit fraud over uh, five hundred thousand dollars. Uh, worth pretty much on real estate in Edmonton and uh, um, ended up going to court and everything and Tiger Jeet Singh ended up having documents all the paperwork and everything being like no I was I was duped by them I wasn't in on them Um, and so he ended up um, getting you know he ended up uh, being declared innocent and um, his brother-in-law ended up going to jail for a year and um, the other person that was in on it uh, ended up going to jail for two years. Um, on, uh, going forward, uh, on August 9th, 10th, and 11th, uh, FMW, they ran three shows in Russia. Uh, these would be FMW's last attempt at running international shows on their own, and, uh, you wrote that they were bombs, like total bomb shows. Uh, what is the story behind these shows? So around 1993, you know, Gregory, uh, Gregory Ver- Verichev, who we talked about, you know, uh, they've been feuding with Onita and everything, the Russian um, judo uh, bronze medalist who had worked for F&W a couple of years, you know, he's in, t- you know, in contact and with Onita and everything and being like, hey, you know, you, sh- you should bring F&W over to Russia. Uh, you know, I- I'll be, you know, it would really work, you know, these kind of gimmicks and everything like that. And then, you know, if I'm on the show and we bring in, you know, some Russian, other Russian, you know, they had a Russian woman, uh, um, Soviet fighter, uh, you know, on in FNW previously as well. If we get her on the show, if we can bring in some Russian hometown people and everything, then we can, you know, have successful stadium shows like you do over in Japan. So, you know, that's going on in 1993. So it takes another, it takes about a year to get the whole process um, under, you know, to actually happen, you know, to get the stadium's book, to get, you know, the FNW uh, wrestlers brought over and everything. Just the whole process took about a year or so. Well, by that time, Grigory Virchev was gone. He wasn't working with FNW anymore. There was no Russians on the card or anything like that. Um, Onita, you know, we had talked about he wanted to go to America and everything. um, he wanted to kind of become like, hey, look, FMW is an international promotion. It's great. You know, it draws well in America, it draws well in Russia and everything like that. He was told, and this is, you know, one of the reasons actually uh, is, that, you know, Grigory or, you know, the Russians are t- telling, hey, there's so many beautiful women that will have sex with the wrestlers and everything like that. The, you know, it's, it's, you know, you'll be able to have, you know, these beautiful women all over you and everything. So, again, Onita's going in thinking, like, we're going to be international superstars. We're going to, um, you know, make all this money. We're going to have all these women. Men, everything like that. So by the time they get there, no Russians on the card, nothing like that. Nobody knows who any of the FNW guys are. So it's, you know, I mean, it's just random. You know, I mean, they announced 600 people for this stadium, which that's a total bomb right away, but it's that's a work to number anyway. So, I mean, they did get people in the building and everything. Um, so, you know, I mean, but nobody knew who any of these people were, uh, you know, who any, nobody knew who any of the FMW wrestlers were. It's, you know, a, a lot of families and everything going to these shows and stuff 
like that. And on top of that, um, they booked hotels in very, very cheap parts of Russia where um, they were expecting all these beautiful women. They were told, well, yeah. Yeah, but they also were very uh, – they hadn't kept up with the um, – they had kind of messed up teeth and everything like that. So a lot of the guys didn't even want to be with the girls that were around that area because they were like, oh, we were expecting these beautiful women. But this is the poor district, and they're not keeping up with themselves kind of thing. So it ended up kind of just back – you know, just total misfire on all – all sorts and everything and um you know like i said the shows bombed completely um onita didn't even want to be on the first two shows because he knew he saw the the numbers of, of tickets that were bought he he removed himself from the, sh the first two shows and and only uh worked the last show which did a li little better they announced 1200 which is double what the um the first two shows did but uh, even then i'm sure you know so that's a work to number and everything but you know these are empty stadiums and everything i mean the, you know the rest are still enjoyed going to a different country and everything but it was not what they were planning on it to be sometimes i feel like this could be like a spinal tap uh segment or something <laughs> but um well okay cool um so uh going forward on uh october 28th uh onita defeated aoyagi um in a you know a big a big death match and um in doing so uh onita needed 111 stitches after the match which gave him the guinness record for the most stitches of any person um i've always heard this about him uh was this record real or was it worked and was it ever actually in the the uh uh the books You'd have to get a 1995 Guinness Book of World Records. I don't think it's I don't think it's real. I don't think it's really in the Book of World Records or anything like that. If you look it up, there's no there's no such record today. I mean, they they would have to come by. You know, there'd have to be someone to come by and actually count all the stitches on your body, and then you add in, you know, people that. Have had horrible accidents and everything like that, where you know where they needed thousands of stitches and everything like like that. So I would imagine it's just a worked number. I mean, I, I believe he's had over a thousand stitches, but I would believe it's a worked record and everything like that. But like I said, you'd have to actually get the Guinness Book of World Records from 1995 to even see if it was in there. But I doubt it. As a kid, when I was like, you know, in, in 98 and 99, I would run, you know, I w when I was in the store, I would try to find the books and I would go through scouring trying to find it. I never found it. I've always yeah, so it, I, yeah, I think it was just something made up and just, hey, look how many stitches I have. I'm sure I have more than anybody else. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, also on the show, Hayabusa was brought in for one night. Uh, he wrestled and defeated Sa Sabu. Uh, this is kind of a famous match. You know, um, there's a lot of big high spots. Sabu does a 450 to the outside through a table where he lands on his knees, which is really painful. But um, why was Hayabusa brought in for this one match? He was told he was being brought in to, you know, showcase off um, that he was going to be a main event talent after Onita retired once he came back and everything. So this was, the, you know, to show off, I'm the ace, look what I can do. Because, you know, at this time, only people in Japan knew about Hayabusa through New Japan Super J Cup. You know, they hadn't even seen Hayabusa wrestle in FMW or anything like that under the mask and whatnot so this was a way to you know show off his moves show what he learned in mexico um you know get a win over sabu and you know so when he did when he came back um he could be the main event you know he could be a main event star and you know it'd be believable instead of him just coming in dry after you know just one jacob appearance and losing the liger you know it'd be established like hey he can defeat sabu even you know who was a pretty top name at the time in, in fmw sabu though was pretty upset over the loss he did not want to lose to hayabusa sabu somebody doesn't like losing and he did he was not a fan of hayabusa coming in and having kind of the same look as him and you know i made mention earlier to hayabusa um was you know really close with the sheik and everything and you know he had kind of been the young boy to sabu and the sheik um in the early days of mmw so then you know sabu sees this guy who's pretty much taking his pants and you know kind of has the same kind of look and everything like him and now he's got to put him over right away you know so he was not happy about this um just to go back to what you were talking about 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 hayabusa being brought back as the ace uh over time um dave wrote that uh so uh, so also on the show matsu tsunaga wrestle Slopogo, and um you know he's kind of being position in that kind of top-ish spot and uh dave wrote that uh apparently some people in in the company they wanted matsunaga lined up to take over for the onita spot while others want hayabusa 
Um, do you know in the in, like what type of friction is there behind the scenes? Like who is backing what guy, and is there any type of consensus at this point about who's going to lead uh, the main event scene? I would imagine Dave or whoever was talking to Dave was just assuming that Matsunaga would be the top guy because, you know, he had prior, prior history of being the top guy in wing. But, you know, he turned heel um, a month later. So, you know, and he was – so there was really no – I mean, and if they wanted Matsunaga to be the top guy, that he was still there. And, you know, they never really went with him and everything. And, I mean, especially, you know, at this time, they don't even really know the direction of the promotion because they ended up, you know, changing their mind on what they wanted FMW to be after O'Neill to retired, you know, with Matsunaga and everything like that, it would have just been FNW light without Onita, and they knew they need, you know, they couldn't do that. And so to make Matsunaga on top, that wouldn't really make sense. And I just think at this time, they didn't even, you know, they had an idea that Hayabusa was going to be a top guy. They had an idea that Goto, um, you know, would still keep his, you know, top spot and everything. And, you know, Matsunaga would be protected and whatnot. But I don't think there was ever a plan of Matsunaga is going to be the guy because, you know, he was the guy in wing and that was you know i mean that was a smaller promotion than fmw you know years ago let alone he's not a homegrown fmw guy like ibusa was um you talked about sabu not being happy with doing the job uh not to jump ahead too far because we're we'll talk about it more in depth later uh like what is the relationship like between sabu and fmw he uh, at this point, you know, I mean, he's got a steady job and everything. He's making about three thousand a month, which you know ends up being about thirty six thousand a year, you know, for a part time, you know, for half half the year kind of job. Um, so he's making decent money and everything, and um, but he's not going to get pushed any more than he has been. You know, he was kind of a top guy in ninety two um, at the top, you know, against Onita, but that program had kind of run its course with the Sheik and everything. So at this point, you know, he's got a solid mid card spot where him and the sheik can have tag matches that go two minutes and he does all the work while the sheik you know walks around and stuff and throws a fireball or whatnot so you know he's got a gig um you know for life at this point but he is looking elsewhere he's you know at this point his body is hurting you know it's been a couple years you know he's working ecw also half the time um you know he's looking for more money at this point so um you know and fmw is not gonna put him in a top spot anymore to make the top money so um he's not the happiest at this point with fmw um also on the card mr ganoske he had one of the largest wins ever at at, at this point uh defeating sambo uh saki uh what are the expectations for ganoske going forward well, I think also with that Sambo Osaka losing was uh, the fact that um, his body was breaking down, Sambo was, and he knew he was retiring soon. So I think it was just, hey, Sambo's, you know, kind of a top tier guy. We can, you know, let's have him put, uh, you know, let's have the younger guys uh, get wins over him to kind of show that they're, they're top guys also. So with Ganesuke, he was kind of fit to be a number two, three guy in the promotion. You know, they saw they he was um, – pretty much Tarzan Goto's right hand man at this point. He was helping uh, with Goto with the dojo. He was kind of the live-in uh, wrestler at the dojo, making sure all the wrestlers that were training and everything, you know, he, he kind of took over that spot and whatnot. So he, um, you know, he's got, he's high up in the company and everything, but you know, they don't see him as a top guy or even a number two top guy at this point, you know, just kind of a solid hand who's willing to have death matches and, you know, not much of a great worker or anything like this, but you know, he can take a good beating and stuff. So, so kind of, you know, the FNW, you know, typecast of what a lot of wrestlers, you know, get and everything. Uh, are there are there any other major notes from this show that you'd like to go over? Yeah, so um, in the semi-main event of the show, um, Tarzan Goto takes on Hizagatsu Oya in a, uh, a bloody 20-minute match where they just beat the hell out of each other. And after the match, um, Tarzan Goto wins, and he shakes hands with Hizagatsu Oya for, you know, just so, you know, you show me the respect and, you know, you put me through something. And so they agree to be tag partners. Well, Ganosuke and um, Katsutoshi Niyama, who were kind of, you know, Goto's younger, you know, young boys and everything kind of, you know, worked under the worked under Goto. You know, they're pretty upset. Like, wait, you're bringing, you know, you're teaming up with a heel. And so this sets up, you know, a tag team feud and everything with uh, Ganosuke and Niyama um, going up against Goto and uh, Oya. And Goto and Oya win. They're, you know, they're above Ganosuke and Niyama. Uh, and so it looks like 
that Goto and Niyama are, I mean, sorry, Goto and um, Oya, you know, they're going to be a, a full on tag team. And so he, Goto isn't really necessarily turning heel. He's not, you know, against Onita or anything like that, but it's just kind of like he's embracing a heel partner and everything. So there's kind of always that confusion of Goto turning heel, which he's done, you know, so many times and everything and he'll, he'll do again. But at this point, he's just kind of embracing a heel wrestler kind of, or, you know, kind of going, no, he's changed his, you know, tune. He's going to, you know, be with me and, and we're going to be a face tag team and nobody else likes. Oh, well, all right. Um, also, uh, at the end of the month, uh, word starts to get around that uh, Kenny Miro will be leaving IWA and, the, and, and he'll be joining FFMW. Uh, do you know who reached out first? So Kanemura signed with uh, IWA Japan uh, for two years after he left after Wing closed down, and Kanemura loved Wing. He loved everything about Wing. Um, you know, his, he, it was all his friends were there. He really loves Mickey Ibaragi. And everything, and so you know, I, Wing closes down. And he was the last one standing with Wing, so Wing closed down, and he joins all his friends and everything. And Victor Canones, who he loves, you know, his work is um, with the management with IWA Japan. So he, you know, he trusts them and everything, and he signs this two-year deal with IWA Japan. Well, with Wing, he was making a thousand dollars a month, and, and with the agreement that Victor Canones would pay all his food and everything like that. Well, with IWA Japan, with Canones getting you know booking position and everything, he was promised um he was promised twenty five hundred dollars if he were to get over so a month so he would be making you know two and a half times more than he was making a wing well he ends up only getting paid fourteen hundred dollars um a month and he's feeling like he's the most over guy on the show and you know he had probably one of the biggest name values after wing working uh, with iwa japan at the beginning so he's upset you know he feeling he's getting screwed over over a thousand dollars a month and you know um and you know the agreement was if he got over and he feels like he got over so he but he wasn't getting paid like he did so he reached out to onita and uh uh, contacted them and you know hey can you get me in on fmw and so they do a secret agreement where Onita promises him ten thousand dollars a month, which is you know so much more than he was making with you know with IWA Japan. But the thing was, is he signed that two-year contract with um, IWA Japan. So Onita agrees. You know they work out the deal and everything. Um, but one thing is, you Kanemura could not tell Matsunaga that he was making ten thousand dollars a month. He had to tell Matsunaga he was making five thousand dollars a month because matsunaga was also making ten thousand dollars a month and he would have got upset feeling wait i'm a bigger name and i'm a bigger star than kanamura and he's making the same mu as much as me so he would have had an issue with that so they had to say you have you can't tell matsunaga you know how much you're making or anything like that also they made strict rules based off um, him kind of just leaving iwa japan um you know you need to just take taxis and not subways going forward because and which taxis in japan are so much more expensive than going the subway because they felt that iwa was so upset that they were going to send the yakuza after him so um you know he had to move into a new place and um no one from iwa japan could know where he lived so it was this whole thing where you know he, he's making more money and but he's gonna have to live a more expensive life and everything and kind of hide from anyone in iwa japan uh, at the possibility of the yakuza finding out Jeez, that's awful <laughs> He made a lot of money from it, though, so and, so and he kept that money the whole time in FMW. So I think he'd still make that deal again. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I would. Uh, I would take taxis. Taxis are okay, but yeah, taxis are very expensive for anyone who's ever been there. Um, so, uh, well, keeping kind of with him uh, on se on September seventh, uh, FMW they drew six thousand fans in in Sapporo to see uh, Onita defeat Pogo, win back the FMW Brass Knuckles Championship. After the match, Kanemura debuted, and um, he attacked Onita with a barbed wire bat, left him bloody. Um, is Kanemura seen as a star by the FMW fans? A second level star. I mean, he's a talented worker, um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, Matsunaga would would expect to be getting paid more than Kanemura, but FMW was willing to pay him as much as Matsunaga, who was a very big name, you know, a bigger name in Wink while they, Kanemura and Matsunaga were together. So, um, but, you know, they kind of saw the potential in Kanemura, and, um, you know, I mean, they, they liked Kanemura, and, you know, I mean, he wasn't anyone that was ever going to beat Onita or Goto or anything like that, but, you know, he'd have good semi-main event matches 
matches or he could be thrown into death matches and whatnot. So he was seen as, um, you know, a good hand, but I mean, he was never going to be, uh, you know, defeating Onita or anything like that. What are the angles being used to introduce him to the uh, roster? So uh, right after he signed up with FMW, he ended up uh, ended up having issues with his back that, you know, after he got power bombed into the fire um, back in 93. So he actually, you know, he's he's um, he had recurring back issues because of the skin tear, you know, the skin being burnt off and everything. So he had to go to a hospital visit and Matsunaga, you know, having a relationship with him in wing uh, previously to FMW, he goes to the hospital to check up on him you know see his friend and everything like that um and onita ends up finding out about this and gets really upset at matsunaga grabs him by the shirt and starts screaming at him, are you you know are you leaving you know are you a traitor like you know goto has been saying and whatnot because you know the whole thing with matsunaga was is he going to turn on onita for pogo well he never did that but you know onita's thinking he might turn you know he might turn on uh me you know for kanamura and everything you know he's going to the hospital to see him and everything so this pisses off matsunaga who ends up um, going, you know what? I'm gonna, I am gonna leave you now because you're gonna talk to me like that. You're gonna treat me like that. You know what? I am gonna go form a relationship with my friend, and we're gonna be a team. And so, so Matsunaga and Kanemura, who you know, um, he hadn't started wrestling at this point. Um, you know, he was doing kind of um, at the end of the show attacks on Onita and whatnot. Um, you know, show. So Matsunaga and um, Kanemura, um, you know, form a team, and they kind of create a, a wing uh, relationship team which we're going to talk about very shortly because I have a lot of questions about that. Um, but uh, going forward, uh, on September 25th, uh, FMW ran one of its more famous shows, The Pool Deathmatch. For anyone who hasn't seen it, it's, um, it's, it, it's just really cool to watch. They have the ring in a pool on a floating platform. The wrestlers have to go to, have to, go to the ring by boat. They have the, bar, the barbed wire strung up and... Uh, the goal of the match is to push your opponents into the water where a bomb will go off. Um, it's a big six-man uh, tag. Um, like, I have just a couple questions. The first, obviously, is like, what you know, where did the idea for this come from, and how dangerous was this? Um, the idea is for uh, I, I could not find out where the idea came from. I actually asked uh, Mr. Ganaske, who was in the match, and he didn't know who came up with the idea. So I'm pretty sure it's not any. You know, I mean, nobody really knows. Um, uh, I would guess it's either Onita or Goito. At this point, Goito was kind of the brains of the operation, or, you know, Onita might have came up with the idea himself. But it's either one of those two, but nobody, you know, I can't imagine anybody really knows if Ganesuke himself didn't know. Um, as far as it being dangerous, it could be very, very dangerous. Um, they were told you need to watch out for the landmine parts of, you need to, you know, when you fall into the water and everything you need to watch out for the explosions because you could lose you know something could get blown off pretty much um if you hit too close to the explosions so i mean nothing happened as a result but it could have been you know if someone did something stupid or landed the wrong way which is uh that's that's so absurd to hear because you know uh the one that stands out is uh mike awesome he takes a a, a bump where they hit him with a couple weapons and he flies out back first and takes just a flat back bump in the water like he couldn't control where he landed. I was reading your article and I couldn't believe how dangerous it really was. Um, just curious, uh, did FMW ever think about running a second version of this? No, because at this point it's September 25th, so it's late September. Um, you know, it had to be the perfect um, temperature to run this you couldn't run it in july it was the, it would have been too hot for the crowd and too hot for the wrestlers to be working outside um with all the humidity and that uh, japan i don't know if you've been to japan in july um uh, but humidity is horrible you know over the definitely summer definitely hot so, absolutely definitely yeah so it ha and it couldn't be too cold so you couldn't do it in the winter so this had to be the perfect time you know late september and it was the perfect temperature it was 25 celsius 77 degrees you couldn't do it hotter you couldn't do it colder so you know it ended up working out perfectly, but, you know, so you couldn't just keep run, you know, working this, couldn't run it again pretty much like October, November. Uh, and by the time, you know, we get into spring or by fall, um, you know, it just didn't happen. And then Onita retired and, you know, they kind of moved direction, you know, moved away from the death matches anyway. So um, they never thought of doing this again um, after this first time. 
Um, also on the show, as you mentioned, uh, they did an angle where, you know, uh, uh, Kenimura, Oya, Hosaka, Matsunaga, Mr. Pogo, they reformed the Wing Army. Um, now, I'm curious, so what is the legality of using the Wing name and the logo? Um, I mean, I, I would imagine Mickey Rab Ibaragi could, you know, sue them, but I think that Kanemura had such a relationship with Ibaragi, um, you know, and, and Wing's not running anymore. Um, I mean, it wasn't something that that they were going to go to court over or anything like that. I mean, I don't know if they had specific permission to, you know, to use it, but they, you know, they, they did it. And I think they were under the impression that nothing legally was going to happen because, um, you know, I mean, they, they waited to, you know, they kind of had a wing group prior to wing closing down with Pogo and Matsunaga in 93, but, you know, they never used the wing name, but as soon as wing closed down, they felt they, you know, they had the right to use that name and the logo and everything. And they did. And I mean, nothing ever came of it. So, all right. Um, and also at the end of the month, they announced, you know, they held a big press conference. They announced the formation of the Wing Army. They added Goro, Sarumi, and Hito. I believe Mike Awesome also joined, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, they announced that, you know, just like Zero One and a few other angles that have happened, that, that, that they announced that this is going to be a separate company that's going to run its own cards. Was there any real thought that this would be a running second brand and like like how much is, is work and how much is shoot and is fmw in charge of this angle yeah fmw is in charge of it it's um they're trying to portray themselves as a second promotion to where it's like you know hey, you know wing was a separate promotion that was feuding with fmw you know in 92 93 so there's that legitimacy to it um you know so they're trying to portray themselves as a different promotion you know um that they hate fmw and everything like that but it's completely controlled under fmw um they end up working one wing show in january 95 um where you know wing fans are there and everything um and you know it's it's it was to kind of have a different, you know, look and different feel to the show that they were doing every day. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about it next episode, but, you know, they have Onita work the opening match to embarrass him and stuff like that. So it's just to do something different, but it was completely under control of FMW um, so that they could, you know, have a legit, have something that seemed legit, like an interpromotional feud. Awesome. And, um, so, okay, so also on, on this show, I'll let you cover it, but the Tarzan Goto angle keeps on going. Uh, do you want to just kind of go over that? Yeah, so during the swimming pool death match, uh, or well, during the swimming pool show, uh, Goto and Oya, like I mentioned, were a tag team, and they're taking on the wing team of Matsunaga and Kanemura. Well, during the match, Oya ends up turning on Goto. Um, and so it ends up being all three of them. Goto's fighting back, um, but, you know, all three of them end up laying him out. And so Onita sees this, comes out, but, you know, obviously there's the ring is in the middle of a swimming pool. So he can't wait for the little, you know, boat to bring him to the ring. So he jumps into the pool and swims to the ring to make the save for Goto. And he ends up, you know, throwing Kanemura in the pool you know, knocking Matsunaga in the pool, everything like that, and, you know, clearing the way for Goto. Well, Glo Goto is embarrassed, ashamed, you know, here he was going, I'm, you know, wanted to be a tag team partner with Oya, you know, kind of break away from FMW, even though, you know, he didn't really turn on him. He just kind of wanted a, you know, group, you know, he felt he could trust Go Oya and he ended up getting betrayed for it. So he's kind of ashamed and everything. And he ends up taking the, he can't even really look at Onita or anything. He ends up, um, taking the uh, boat back by himself uh, without even looking at Onita. Um, they end up, I mean, they end up, Ogoto and Onita end up teaming up, but, um, you know, it kind of, this is kind of lays way for 1995, where, again, Goto will end up um, leaving the Onita group. So it was just kind of the beginning of something, uh, something else for 1995. All right, and um, I'm sure we'll cover it more then, but, like, it does... Is is there any backstage feeling about you? You know, is uh, basically does Tarzan Goto ever stand up and say I look like an idiot with these angles? Um, I don't know specifically about these angles, but I mean, he ends up up leaving FMW and you know being the number two guy to Onita, always losing to Onita, always look looking bad to Onita, you know, I mean, that is always kind of assumed that was the reason he ended up leaving FMW is because he was just never going to, you know, Onita would never let him out of the shadow. Yeah. Um, so also uh, in IWA News, uh, which there's a lot, 
Um, Dick Murdoch leaves IWA on September 29th. He's the current IWA champion. Um, he jumped ship to war. Uh, you mentioned before that with Kanemura, he was promised one number and wound up getting a lower number. Uh, was Dick Murdoch leaving just about uh, money? I didn't know anything about money. I know he ended up um, vacating the title first because, and he ended up having to leave the tour early because his mother um, was sick. So he had to go back to America. So he couldn't finish out the tour. And then when he came back, he just agreed to work for war. So I'm sure that war offered him more money. Um, but yeah, the reason he gave that he couldn't f uh, finish out the IWA and had to give back the belt was because his mother was ill. Um, also, at this time, IWA announced that starting in November, Terry Funk would be coming into IWA. Um, how big of a get was this perceived as for them? It was a big get. I mean, and it was it kind of put them as legitimate. And like I mentioned, you know, Kanemura was kind of the top guy in IWA Japan um, around, you know, this point, and then he left. And, you know, I mean, like, Kanemura was kind of a second-tier guy in FMW, so they didn't really have, like, a top, top guy in IWA Japan. Getting Terry Funk, that will get you, you know, that's a top guy right there. That's someone that, you know, had a big name in Japan and can help you draw. So it was, you know, the biggest acquisition that IWA Japan um, had at the time. Um, and uh, what is the reaction from FMW? The, there's nothing really they can, you know, say, can't, you know, Onita does, can't really say much. I'm, I mean, I don't know how he personally felt or anything, but, you know, he um, he had opportunities to work with Funk more. And um, Funk, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to put Funk over. Uh, he didn't want to have another match with Funk. So, um, you know, they end up up kind of not working together anymore as a result and so terry got an offer from iwa japan and took it and so onita can really you know be upset or you know and onita loves funk he always will so i mean terry can really honestly do anything and onita's even if he's upset that day he'll end up loving terry uh at the end of the you know at the end of all uh, at the end of everything um i i know that you you just answered it but um you know there was always talk there was you know you know dave wrote that there were always um funk was always trying to put together a second match that would take place in america they wanted to put it on paper per pay-per-view there were money backers trying to get the match to happen but uh why did onita never want to do that match and i think you you just answered it but. Yeah, he didn't want to do the job. Yeah, he didn't want to do the job and I mean, I don't know about the America aspect. I mean, that might have been something separate, but yeah, he didn't want to lose to Terry after he already defeated Terry and in Japan, he didn't want to ever have a second. You know, so they promised to do, you know, they worked their relationship, you know, when they first started um for Terry to come over to FMW was they were going to work two big, you know, shows together and you know, the first one Onita would win, the second one Terry would win and, and you know, Onita kind of got what he wanted and, you know, why do it again? You know, why do a second one and me lose? So uh, just to kind of wrap up that, um, IWA announced that uh, Funk will be doing four different death matches, and they're also announcing, you know, some new stipulations that we're going to go over when they happen, like glass matches, nail matches, etc. So IWA is pulling no stops and trying to gain ground. Um, also, at the end of the month, making his IWA debut is going to be Yoshihiro Tajiri. Uh, he would go on to become a relatively decent star. Uh, where did he come from, and uh, what was his history at this point? He was a kickboxer um, who had trained with Animal Hamaguchi, who, who was a former uh, New Japan wrestler. Um, and Hamaguchi trains a lot of wrestlers kind of like outside, like where you, you know, you're getting training before you join a dojo. So you kind of have, you know, the understanding how to work a match and everything, have proper training without, you know, actually being aligned with a, a natural promotion. So Tajiri was trained, you know, kind of like a freelance way of, you know, independently and everything. And then so uh, IWA Japan uh, picked him up and he was, a, you know, he was a young worker and showed a lot of talent. And, you know, most people know him um, in ECW and WWF and WWE, you know, he ended up being a great worker. Um, uh, so going into October, there's a story that, I read it, and I had no clue that this happened, and I thought maybe you knew about this. Uh, there's a story that uh, New Japan started a side company called Hisei Ishingun um, that will use wrestlers from a dozen different companies, including IWA and FMW. Uh, what was this, and whatever became of it? 
That was a heel stable in New Japan um, that Shiro Kashinaka, um, you know, led um, as kind of a heel group um, against the New Japan workers. Um, Great Kabuki was in it, and um, Oyagi was in it. I never heard anything about FNW or IWA Japan having anything to do with this group. I mean, it might have just been talk or whatever, but Oyagi, who was, like I said, a member of the group, he ended up leaving this group to work FNW. Um, so I don't know if maybe there were there's confusion with you know him being part of the group and then working FMW or something like that, but I never heard or there was never anything, especially on the FMW in in regards to this group, uh, them working together or anything like that. Um, also, uh, in this month, uh, so uh, to hype up Funk coming into Japan, uh, Terry. Terry Funk is going to the media and he's doing interviews where he's challenging Onita to a million dollar match where they'll each put up five hundred thousand um, zen dollars. <throat> how much is work? How much is shoot? Does Onita take this seriously? Um, is there any chance of a match happening? You know, no, there's no chance of it happening. It's just uh, Terry kind of agreeing. To, it's probably IWA Japan's idea to you know get publicity and everything like that. Um, you know, Terry's challenging him. Onita and he's not accepting he's a coward everything like that um I don't think Onita any, knew anything or really cared at this point I mean it ended up setting up for um you know down the line you know matches with them um but at this point point uh, Onita's not going to work IWA Japan and, and I think it's just IWA Japan just trying to like you know get uh publicity and everything like that look you know Onita he won't he's too scared to come to IWA Japan cool uh, now on October tw uh, on October twenty eighth, uh, FMW set kind of a record. Uh, they they sold out Kurokin Hall, but because the ticket prices were so high, they grossed a hundred thousand U.S. dollars off of about twenty two hundred tickets. Um, what are the prices like for FMW compared to the other groups? Um. Um, yeah, I I never heard of the, of this much. I mean, usually the tickets are about the same of what the, um, all promotions. You know, like a hundred dollars for uh, front row type seats. You know, uh, fifty dollars um, for you know kind of sit. You know, get those orange seats at Corrigan Hall. Um, you you know, and then thirty-five, forty dollars for you know standing room only kind of seats. So, uh, I mean, usually they would make about fifty thousand dollars at a Corgan Hall show. Um, so I can't imagine how they made five hundred thousand. Um, so that would be, yeah, they would have had to pull make two hundred dollar, three hundred dollar, one hundred dollar tickets. You know, um, so I hadn't heard anything about that. Usually, like usually the tickets are all the same at Corgan Hall. But um, so, I mean, like I said, it would, they would have had to have a, incre a huge increase uh, for this show. Mm. Um, also, on October 30th, uh, Onita defeated Great Sasuke in a big, a big explosion gin match. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's famous for Sasuke doing this giant dive over, over the barbed wire, which they've strung up higher than normal and stuff. It's a very good match, in my opinion. Uh, what was the split like between, between FMW and Miss Sh Shinoku Pro? Um, Michinoku Pro got all the pro, uh, proceeds and everything. It was a Michinoku Pro show. Um, Onita got you know his payday for being in the main event. I don't know how much or anything like that, but Onita made his money, I'm sure. But um, you know, Michinoku Pro uh, made all you know they they received all the money for the show, um, and it did well. You, you know, drew over six thousand people um, outside venue and everything, and so it did. You know, they had to pay for the explosions and everything, and pay for Onita, but it was still a successful show the biggest show they had ever had actually at that point um i'm 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 just curious was there a team that did the explosion match setup like did onita say oh you want this guy you know he always does it for me um i don't i don't know i'm sure that they probably you know probably onita may have help you know set him up like hey this you know this company or whatnot they'll help you out but i i'm just guessing okay <laughs> Uh, now uh, I'm just curious. We've seen Onita have have like falling outs with uh, some of his high name uh, opponents, but with Sasuke, they've always been friends. They always bring him in for shows. You know, Onita came and did and did this match for his uh, uh, company. Why was Sasuke so much e so much easier to work with? 
Uh, because Onita, you know, Onita was a bigger star than Sasuke, and most of these guys that you know, Tenru or um, you know, things like that, um, you know, they're at the level of Onita or bigger. With Sasuke, Onita, you know, has more seniority. He's a bigger name. FNW is a bigger promotion than Michinoku Pro. So Sasuke is more willing to work with Onita and kind of, you know. Um, you know, accept him for who he is, and you know, Onita's. Oh, of course, Onita's gonna win. You know, um, and Sasuke, you know, is a business businessman, and he sees Onita making him money and everything. So, um, and you know, they just always got along and every and whatnot. But you know, there, there was no real ego. It was always Onita's one, Sasuke's two. Whereas, you know, like I said, someone with a Tenru, Tenru's not gonna be two to Onita. So it's just kind of you know, Sasuke kind of knew his place when it came to uh, working with Onita. Um, war, uh, it's, you know, it's known that war is on its last legs as far as, uh, the money goes and now has made the announcement, uh, you know, N-O-W, the company, that, um, uh, that talent can now work anywhere and talent is signing off to other, their companies. Well, war actually made, war actually made it to 1998 on a full-time basis so they were yeah they were struggling there but you know they switched management they i think they got a new sponsor or anything like that but yeah they still they still worked a couple more years and i mean and they still had single hall shows and all and everything so i know there was a scare with war and uh tenru actually got um, a family member to take over as president um as a result you know out of fear of the, of the promotion going bankrupt but no they were ended up war ended up making it um a couple more years um into into 1998. Uh, on October 25th, on a now show, uh, making his debut was Ryuji Yamakawa. Um, if you could just kind of go over him and uh, what his career was like. Well, yeah. So he started with now, and um, as you may mention, now is on its last legs, and it's not going to make it at the end of the year. Um, he ends up um, getting with uh, Tokyo Pro, a, a, a new promotion that just uh, starts up in um, in December or so and he ends up not making much longer there. He gets transferred over to the Big Japan uh, dojo um, and he's one of the first uh, Big Japan wrestlers and he's pretty much well best known for um, becoming one of the first good uh, deathmatch workers in J Big Japan along with um, uh, Tomiyaki Hama and they had um, these crazy bloody awesome matches in Big Japan 1990, uh, 1999 2000 or so and um, he ended up suffering a, a um, severe head injury off a bad spot with a uh, CCW wrestler uh, wife beater um, he ended up having brain a brain injury came back um, and just kind of did more mid card and comedy matches until he retired in 2012 um, cool not cool. I'm gonna take that out. <laughs> no, he he was really one of my favorites, and when when he was injured, it was really devastating for me. So anyway, um, going over to IWA, uh, Terry Funk debuted on November 12th. Um, he like I said before, uh, they um, they advertised four four bigger death matches involving being, being him. Uh, these would be a fire match. They had a glass bottle match and also a, uh, a, a cage match and, and such. But the fire match is especially brutal, very dangerous. Terry Funk, there are spots where he's burning his hands, obviously. They have these uh, cans on the ropes with, with fire. He would write that these cans were much more dangerous than, than just having fire because the cans became so hot. Um... How does Funk take to this more extreme version of wrestling? You know, he was always into brawling and stuff, but this is really pushing the envelope. Uh, do you know his opinions on these matches? He just sees it as, you know, going into the office, I got to do what I got to do, and um, this is what, you know, this will make me money, and I'll, you know, I'm down for it, I'm game for it. Um, his family, though, was very concerned, you know, his, his wife and his two daughters were always, would tell him, you know, don't do this, it's not worth it, please don't, but he would just see it as, you know, it's not, I can handle it, and, you know, I mean, he obviously, you know, I'm sure he d dealt with a lot of pain, but, you know, he was able to keep going. Um, do you know? Uh, do you know what Funk was making for these tours? I don't know what he made in IWA Japan. The only thing I know about is he made um, twenty thousand dollars off his um, FMW match at Kawasaki in '93 against Stonita. So he made a good deal of money for one show. But I don't know as far as um, I, as far as IWA Japan. The only thing I know is um, Asano, who was the owner of IWA Japan, gave him an offer that he was okay with, that he um, that he agreed to. He he liked the money that he was getting. So there was no number. I never saw any numbers, specific numbers or anything. 
and uh, is Funk draw is is Funk drawing fans for uh, uh for them? Yeah, it's it's you know it's slowly going up. It's you know IWA Japan, um, you know, and uh, they feel they can you know compete against FMW uh, coming up soon. They feel that they've got the uh, you know they got the, and they're about to. You know, you know, bring in some more guys and everything like that, and they feel that they, ha- you know, have what it takes to compete with FMW, and um, especially with Onita, you know, his retirement, uh, you know, is coming. They feel that they could take over, you know, and become bigger than FMW after Onita retires. So it's, you know, it's building um, at this point um, for the promotion. It's also reported that uh, Cactus Jack is going to be coming in uh, in January of '95. Uh, what spurred them to bring in him? Like I said, so, you know, that was kind of the, th- uh, you know, had Funk and some, you know, they bring in Cactus Jack. They felt like those were the two, you know, guys that they could really kind of book around and, and whatnot, be the big st- foreign stars and everything. And, you know, Victor Quinones was willing to offer him, uh, was willing to offer Cactus Jack enough money that he was willing to come in um, while uh, working ECW. Um, so uh, in November, FMW, they only ran a handful of shows at the end of the month, uh, headlined by the Wing versus FMW feud. But on November 23rd, you wrote that Mr. Ganoske suffered a injury. Uh, what what happened to him? He got cut up really bad in a barbed wire match. Um, his back... Um, and I can post the picture or show you the picture. It's it's pretty bad off. He's got really deep cuts and everything on his back. Um, so he was un, he was able to um, after a barbed wire match. So he was able to work one more show after that, and he just couldn't go anymore. And they just gave him the month off um, to heal up because they were really deep wounds. Uh, on on December first, FNW they ran a, a show in. Hiroshima in front of about 8,000 fans where Onita and Goto, they teamed up to defeat Oya and Pogo, but they used, uh, but they debuted some new uh, characters. Uh, what is the history with this match? Uh, so Onita and Goto use uh, alter ego gimmick uh, gimmicks where they kind of, uh, Onita face paints, uh, he pretty much comes up with the Great Nita gimmick where he paints his face uh, similar to the Great Muda and spits mist and everything like that uh, on his opponents. And then uh, Tarzan Goto uses uh, a gimmick called Hochi Win, which was kind of um, a takeoff of Ho Chi Minh, a Vietnamese uh, dictator. Um, but it was also the gimmick he used while uh, working in uh, America before coming to FMW. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of their alter egos going up against Pogo and Onita. I mean, sorry, against Pogo and Oya. And, you know, Onita spitting mist and, uh, and you know, just acting different, acting like the great Muda and whatnot, which was obviously a very popular character at the time uh, in New Japan. So this, you know, it's kind of like, to show off like hey look these are different you know look how they can betray you know they can betray different characters and everything like that um now does uh uh does does kg mudo have any reaction to this i don't know if he had it publicly um i'm sure he wasn't a fan of you know kind of him stealing the gimmick pretty much but uh you know five years down the line he ended up making a good deal of money uh, having a match with Nita based off of it. So I can't imagine he was a fan, but, you know, five years later, I'm sure he, he enjoyed the money that he made based off the match. Uh, Sabu and The Sheik, they returned for this tour. However, Sabu signed an agreement with New Japan, including running an angle on December 11th for them. Uh, we kind of talked about it earlier, but what is the story behind Sabu leaving? Yeah, so it's pretty much just money. He didn't see himself as ever being a main player with FMW, and at this point, his body is hurting, and he wants to make as much money as possible. So New Japan came calling, and they offered him more money, and so he finishes the tour with FMW, and that same day, he uh, heads out to New Japan. He finishes the, uh, the, the FMW show in the afternoon, and by night, he's working New Japan and traveling with them to start the tour with, uh, with um, and, you know, he forms a uh, t- team with Chono. Masahiro Shono. So, you know, and so he was pretty much just kind of promised a better position, better um, movement in the promotion and more money, which is the main thing he wanted at this point. All right. Now, um, on December 20th, uh, um, FMW, they ran a show in Nagoya. It drew 11,000 people. Um, it was uh, the Great Nita versus Pogo in a Lumberjack match. Um so this is a match I just want to ask. We kind of covered it last time, but uh, during the match, you know, Pogo brings out his large knives and his scythe and blah, blah, blah. But during it, you know, usually they'll 
put the guy on the ropes and kind of stab his head for photos and stuff. But in this match, uh, both wrestlers, they're grabbing the knives and they're swinging them wildly into their backs, into their shoulders, into their, their stomachs. Onita has this pool of blood in his shoulder that just won't stop bleeding. Um, you, you know, we've talked about it before. Were these real knives? Like, what is the danger of this? And what? And did either of them walk away with any serious injuries? Uh, like I mentioned, I I don't think there were serious injuries. They knew what they were expecting. You know, I mean, it hurts, and you know, the leaving scars and everything. But um, I mean, it's not something that you know that took that made them out of action or anything like that. And especially Onita, who's couldn't miss any shows, you know, he was the headline and everything. So he, you know, like I mean, mentioned Ganesuke had some pretty deep cuts from Barb watch and they let him take the month off because, you know, they can have an FMW show without Ganesuke at this point, they can't have an FMW show without Onita. So if Onita is suffering the same, you know, deep scars, you know, deep cuts that Ganesuke is having, he's still going to work the shows. He's still, he's not going to miss um, any, you know, time or anything like that. So, you know, and again, he, you know, they know what they're getting into at this point. You know, they, you know, Onita has been working with Pogo for over a year, at, um, you know, at, straight at, um and so yeah there might be some you know gashes and there might be some cuts and you know and i'm sure they hurt but you know he knows what it he knows how to get you know get away and get get away with it and come come away with it um uh, you know in one piece um so uh some hayabusa notes to finish out the year um he went on to win the uh there's in mexit in mexico there's a sports magazine called Box and Lucha. He won the Rookie of the Year award. Um, you wrote that he had a couple injury scares. Um, overall, how was his his 1994, and what are the immediate plans for 1995? Yeah, so like you may mention, you know, he won Rookie of the Year. He got pretty, he got himself pretty over as like this young sensation and everything like that. And um, he ended up um, he. With uh, he ended up getting with Ultimo Dragon, and so Ultimo Dragon, who's probably you know really well known for having the Tori Uman um, dojo in Mexico, um, you know getting the starts of Shima and, and you know Magnum Tokyo and everything like that, Dragon Kid. So before he started that, he started his own you know he started um, up a training camp called the Hall of Dragon, and. And he invited Hayabusa, he invited Chris Jericho, he invited Kendo Kishin, um, you know, to kind of look to to kind of train them to learn some moves and everything. And you know, they got they worked out on the ring and everything like that. They, you know, and Hayabusa, um, you know, learned some new moves just you know trying out on the mat and everything. And um, you know, he he had already was using the 450 splash that he um, that Too Cold Scorpio was using, and he kind of um, came up with a variation of it, and um, which is best known as the Phoenix splash so he came up with that move himself um and he also um chris jericho like i made mention he was you know training as well um and, and chris jericho showed him how to do the acai moon salt the lion salt um on the middle you know through the middle rope and everything so he's learning all these high flying moves to pretty much bring back to japan so he can you know incorporate them when he you know when he becomes the main guy in fmw well he can't. He 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 needs to be a heavyweight. He's only 209 pounds, so he's still a junior heavyweight in Japan. I mean, in Mexico, and he knows. You know, I'm, if I'm going to be in, a, a top guy in FMW, I need to be. I need to get bigger. Well, the issue with Mexico is he keeps getting sick all the time in Mexico, so he can't keep. You know, he can't uh, keep his weight. He keeps losing weight while in Mexico because all the food's making him sick. So he knows. Um, in starting in 1995, he needs to go to America. And he's going to train with Mike Awesome um, and get some and, and live in Florida going forward, uh, starting in 1995. All right now on December 13th, IWA ran uh, a show. This wound up um, as far as the tape, you know, the tape trading world went. This was kind of famous, and I had it on a couple different compilations. It was uh, Nakamaki and Ono versus two leather their leather faces in a spike nail match. Now in this. They wound up putting the spike nails on the ring. They had boards, uh, or I'm I'm sorry, the ropes. They had boards attached to the ropes. They had big boards in the the corners. I think they may have even had barricades on the on the outside. And anyone who sees this, you know, usually when the wrestlers are hitting the nails, they kind of they 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 slow down. They take the bumps on their shoulders, but. Um, in this match, you know, they're going full blast. They're taking real hard bumps. The Leatherface characters are really just 
dropping the nail boards on them. They're doing splashes on them on the the boards. Um, why was this match so out of hand? Um, well, pretty much Mike Kirshner, um, Leatherface did not want to do the job in the match. And so he decided that he was just going to beat the crap out of the other guys out of, uh, Ono and, uh, Hiroshi Ono and, uh, Shoji Nakamaki. So he is legitimately just beating the crap out of these two guys out of the frustration of, wait, I have to lose to these guys. Uh, yeah, anyone who can see it, it's it's it, it, it's a brutal match. It's one of the more brutal ones from this era, for sure. <clears throat> um, uh, so with the year ending, just to kind of wrap up, we got two new companies that are gonna that are going to be sprouting up. Um, one is uh, the great the great Kojika announced that uh, he will be forming a company. Um, at first, it's called the Big Tokyo Pro Wrestling. Of course, this will become the big the big Japan wrestling group and uh, Kendo Nagasaki would be on top. This essentially means that now is officially kind of dead. Um, who was the great Ko Kojika and uh, do you know any information about the, uh, the backers and sponsors of this company? Yeah. Yeah. So Kojika was um, an all Japan worker. Um, he actually started up in uh, JWS. Japan Wrestling Association, which was Ricky Dozan's promotion. That's how long ago he started up. But he he worked um, all Japan uh, throughout um, you know the 70s and the 80s. He worked some Amer he worked in America also. But he 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 ended up finishing up around 1986 and took an office job and everything. Um, I believe with all Japan. And so 1994 comes around and now his closed down, like you may mention, and he gets in contact with Kendo Nagasaki, who was um, running now. And they end up uh, working in a relationship to agree to start up their own promotion, which, like you said, called Big Japan Pro Wrestling. And they end up um, taking some of the, the now talent um, and the now office, so they, uh, including uh, Eji Tosaka, who would end up becoming um, the Big Japan uh, pro, uh, pro Wrestling uh, president, he was just an office worker now at the time. And so they end up bringing in the office employees and start up their own promotion. They don't have much money at this point. So they know they, they see, you know, IWA Japan, they see FNW and how much money they're making. Um, so they kind of see that, you know, the deathmatch market is a way to make money. And, you know, they know that the guys, you know, the now wrestlers and everything, they're not the best. So they know they're going to have to do that type of style also to keep uh, to compete with FNW or IWA Japan. And um, and he's still going. I saw a great Kojika wrestle a couple matches just uh, a month ago. And if you ever meet him and you ever shake his hand, even though I think he's you know he's close to seventy, he's so yeah, he is. he's so solid. It's like Ming. Like he just looks so indestructible. Um, so yeah, good for him. Um, also announced uh, at the end of the year is that uh, starting in March of 1995, Mickey Ibaraki is going to restart Wing. Uh, they're going to bring it back. Jason the Terrible is going to be is going to be on top. Uh, they hope to bring in e uh, wrestlers from ECW to fill out the roster. Um, so this opens up so many questions for me. The first is: uh, Is this attached to the FMW version of Wing, or is this a completely separate company? It's completely separate. This is the actual wing promotion that Miggy Ibaragi, um, you know, was running in 1992, 1993, 1994. It just, you know, essentially was kind of a shut down for a little while, and now he's bringing it back. So, I mean, he owns the name. If he if he wants to start up, you know, a wing promotion today, he could. You know, he owns those right. He owns that right in, in the film and everything like that. FMW never owned the wing name. They just used it. So what does the what does this mean going forward for FMW doing the Wing Army gimmick? It just stays the same. They they keep the Wing name and like I said, you know, I mean they might have had an agreement with Miggy Ibaragi. Um, I don't know, but he didn't, you know, they didn't stop it or anything like that. It, you know, they kept the Wing name going uh, well into 1997, and this Wing promotion didn't make it very much longer. So. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, I read one thing one time that was that uh, because FMW called it the Wing Army, they could, by copyright reasons, they could claim it's a different property and everything. That's how I've always heard it explained. Um, but they also used the logo. So, I mean, they used that Wing logo, which would have been copyrighted if, if it was copyrighted. Maybe it was never copyrighted. I don't know. Um, I could try and find out exactly. But, yeah, I mean, they used the Wing logo. They used the Wing name. Um, so I, I, I just think that Ibaragi just didn't care enough to, like, file, you know, put, you know, pressure them legally or anything like that. 
No. Um, and um, uh, what do the FMW stars like, you know, can, you know can, Kanemura and Matsu to, Matsunaga, um, how do they feel about this? Like, is there any sense that, oh, my God, w w you know, Wing is back and now I'm here? No, because they're making so much money. I mean, like I said, they're making $120,000 a year, whereas, you know, I mean, I don't know how much Matt Sanago was making prior. He wasn't, I think actually he was making 30000 and Kanemura, like I said, was making 12000 a year. So, so money-wise, they know they're in a lot better spot than um, they were with Wing. I mean, you know, Kanemura loved Ibaragi, like I mentioned, but, you know, it wasn't something where he wanted to go back or, you know, you know, break you know he had just gotten out of his iwa japan deal and dealt with the you know yakuza scare as a result he wasn't going to go about you know leaving fmw after coming up with the deal and going to a much smaller promotion because this new version of wing you know there wasn't much but there's not as much potential like originally um and uh one last question which this will probably be answered in the next show but I, i'm i'm just curious uh so Mickey announced that he wanted to put Jason on terrible, or I'm, I'm sorry, Jason the Terrible on top, but Jason the Terrible is with IWA. Um, was Jason leaving, or what transpired of that? Yeah, I believe he left, because um, I don't think he worked IWA Japan anymore. So I think it was just kind of, hey, here's the one guy, you know, from the original FMW, I mean, original wing, I can bring in, and I'll make him the star and everything. So I don't know if he left IWA Japan as a result of, you know, promises for the new wing. But, yeah, he was leaving IWA Japan um, to kind of be, you know, the top guy of this new promotion. It sounds like if you wanted to remake uh, ECW and your top guy was, like, Hack Myers or something. Um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Axel Rotten. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so um, that does it for 1994. This was, what, you know, our biggest, two, you know, series of shows by far. Um did we miss anything? Is there anything that you want to comment on uh, to wrap it up? Um, no, I mean, at this point, you know, Onita's retirement's coming up here on the next episode, so, um, and they're going to start building towards that, and um, it's going to be a very Onita-heavy uh, show coming up, and then Onita will be gone for a little bit. No, it's, uh, yeah, for far too long. I can never get enough of this guy. So, um... <laughs> So with that, uh, we can wrap it up. Uh, Brett, you can shout out where people can find you. Um, BahuFMW.com uh, for my website where I cover all the news, results, biographies. Um, I have an Instagram, BahuFMW World, and I have a Twitter, BahuFMW. Awesome, and you can find me at I, uh, on Twitter at I, I -N -T -L wrestling, Indie Wrestling I -N -T -L dot wordpress dot uh, com where uh, I do weekly updates on death matches in America and Japan. I cover I cover GCW, CZW, Big Japan Freedoms, etc. So between the two of us, I think we've got it all covered. And um, thank you for listening. We'll come back next week with uh, the beginning of 1995, which will lead to the Hayabusa Onita retirement match, which I'll have a billion questions about that. So I look forward to it, and thank you for listening.